Hey everybody, uh, David here with the second part of my Sitkiss highlights. Um, yeah, uh, if you missed the first part, you should probably go back and check that first. I covered the first four rounds today. We're going to cover uh, rounds uh, six through ten. Um, I realize that some of the highlights I'm covering may be kind of educational and I don't know like oh yeah that's very interesting but they're not like the kind of flashy things that you might think of normally when you see the word highlights the word highlight might conjure up you know some kind of smashing tactic an under promotion a queen sacrifice but an average tournament doesn't have tons of those I don't think um but do not worry, I for those of you who didn't tune out after the first video, I do have a few flashy moves in store for you here. Uh, but the focus, yes, is on just uh, highlight as in the most uh, fantastic uh, moves or ideas, etc., which are not all going to necessarily be aesthetic. Some of them are simply, you know, instructive, like well thought out, like, Oh wow, if you put your king on that square, or if you put your pawn on that square in an end game, it sort of has this option available later for you tactically, etc. So anyway, let's let's get into the highlights. This game here is round uh six. Nope. Wrong game. This game here is round six. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um and uh the first thing to note is that um, I was playing uh, a new opening here, in a sense. Um, uh, a Rogozin defense, I guess it's called. A variation of the Queen's Gambit declined with the bishop starting out on, on b4. Um, and that is something I'd, I'd never played before. I played a variety of Queen's Gambit declines, so I don't know if it counts as a totally new opening or not. But it was definitely, I would say, uh, very, very unexpected. And yet... My opponent was, you know, booked, you know, 10 moves in and uh, well prepared. And I would looked at his games and it looked like one of the few openings that he wasn't prepared for, that he hadn't, you know, played any really good lines for white in the past against other people as far as I could tell. And there's, I mean, there's just, I guess there's just nothing you can do these days against some people to get out of their preparation. That said, uh, the line he's played has not really provided white with anything and uh, at this moment in the game my opponent correctly switched into a defensive mode and that's what's fantastic and I want to highlight uh, two pieces of defensive the thinking the first is slightly obvious but you know after this bishop retreats white has a problem around the opposition between the queens the b2 and b7 pawns right um this standoff is often tricky because it's about, you know, making positional valuations. But um, here, even though often in the Queen's Gambit exchange, there's a minority attack option. And you'll see white playing on the queen side. Here, the extra pawn on the queen side, the queen side majority, is making the standoff very, very much in black's favor. Because in my opinion, if white takes on b6 and black takes back with the a pawn, that is in black's favor. As black gets the open A file, the C pawn allows black to advance the B pawn to B5 and possibly even to B4, grabbing more space on the queen side and increasing the scope of the rook or rooks on the A file. On the other end, if black's able to trade on B3 and white takes back, I think that's generally also bad for white because there's two double isolated pawns. They can't really move. They can't expand. A6 kills white's A file for the most part. And uh, these pawns are just just targets for black to attack. And they're not very mobile, etc. So I like black there as well, even though there is one Magnus Carlsen game where with the double isolated pawns, he played a plan of b4, knight a4, knight c5, I think, and outplayed somebody good like Nepo um, and won the game with white with the double isolated b pawns. So... There's exceptions to everything, but broadly speaking, white suddenly finds himself in a position where if they trade on b6, it's kind of bad for them. If they let black trade on b3, it's kind of bad for them. In these situations, uh, it can be very hard 
to make proper judgments, if you try and back off with your queen, which you would like to do, it's hard to find a way where you're not losing queen takes b2, right? Because this bishop is stopping you from going queen c2. It's stopping you from answering with rook b1 and taking on b7. So I kind of thought that white had actually kind of messed up this opening despite um, blitzing out a line that, that he knew better than I did. Uh, at this point, all I could tell was that black... I already thought like it was white who had to find good moves, but find them he did. So here's the first one, knight to d2. An excellent move, preparing to just recapture on b3 with the knight as needed. And this may seem weird and counterintuitive because the knight doesn't normally retreat this way in the queen's gambit accepted. It's more about, you know, going bishop g3, knight e5 or something. Um, and also it's weird because what's, is this standoff going to work? You don't want to move your queen. You don't want to trade. Now your knight can't move either because it's defending the queen that can't move. And so, uh, but it is necessity in a sense, which can help you find this. And maybe my opponent also saw that he can untangle the mess. So this is a very, very excellent defensive move. Uh, if and when the knight comes to b3, it'll be acceptably placed there with some prospects on a5 and c5. Obviously, no quick minority attack or anything, but uh, acceptable. All right, I'm going to skip over uh, a couple moves and come to our next highlight. So in this position, my opponent realized that this knight was probably coming to the d6 square from f6. Um, and that is a very strong square for the knight in this pawn structure, although it's not super, super well known. Like I played the Queen's Gambit exchange from the black side, these kind of Carlsbad structures for probably 20 years without ever uh, hearing about this square. So it was kind of like a mild secret. Now everybody knows so much, maybe everybody else knows this, but I went years without knowing that this could be a good square for the knight. So my opponent noticed that, um, and he and he started thinking, and obviously he considered with the bishops traded, that he could go queen a3, finally avoid this queen trade that he didn't truly want at any point, take control of some dark square, stop knight d6, consider maybe queen e7. Uh, after a trade of bishops, you usually want your queen on the color square of the bishops that have been traded, so that's very, like everything is screaming, this queen a3 move is gonna leave me sort of scrambling as black and get him out of all the annoyances, right? Defend the B pawn, maybe even get it going to B4. The move has seemingly everything, but it has one other thing, a direct refutation. And the refutation is not some kind of tactic. It's not the kind of thing that you notice if you sort of double check, like, am I hanging anything? You know, are there any pieces, this, that, you know, is there any tactic against D2 or E3 or something? No, um, it's just a positional refutation completely, but my opponent saw it and avoided it. And that is queen a3. Well, let's see if any of you can see it. I mean, this is a great chance for you to pause your clock and see if you see uh, a powerful positional move for black. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue along, but I'll just make this comment in favor of Dalvi Akash Sharachandra. It's one thing to find a strong idea uh, from like the black side is even harder in all cases in chess pretty much for almost all people to see the good ideas of your opponent and sort of skate around them that's an even harder thing to do to always be finding good ideas for your opponent as well as for yourself so the refutation to queen a3 would be a5 and what this move prepares is to simply play queen b4 against every move other than knight takes d5 I guess um, and well, there's just, there's actually just nothing white can do. Queen before is going to come. The queen trade is still going to be forced. Um, and it's going to go really badly for white, whether they take on B4 or whether they have black take on A3. Um, it's just way worse than it was when the queens had the stare off on, um, on B3 and B6. And you can bring the queen back to B3 to try and recapture with the knight. Um, but by this point, there's multiple problems with this. Um, one is that black can trade and immediately a4, you grabbing even more space. And others with the queen on b4, they could keep gaining space with b5 and knight b6 and stuff like that, just leaving the queens facing each other um, until you play a3 yourself to quick the queen and force her to make that, that trade on b3. So this would just be uh, really, really 
problematic for white. I would say nearly ruinous. But um, I, he saw he saw the idea and uh, played a very very strong move, rook d one. Uh, instead, just defending the knight, continuing to coordinate his pieces and hold fast in the standoff. Um, so very very excellent uh, defensive play. There's so many different places where quote unquote lower rated players will often go wrong against higher rated players. One is you know noticing that the opponent that the opponent's sort of gotten in a good position that something hasn't worked out and you immediately despair. My opponent didn't do that. You saw two really strong defensive ideas there. Um, I'm going to scoot ahead here. Um, and let me just explain to you what's going on with this position here um, real quick. So black has timed things such that white had to play a3 um, and black should be able to play a4 and then put a knight on c4. And with white's pawn on a3 instead of a2, there will never be b3 to kick the knight, right? Because of the pawn on a4. So that's going to become a pseudo outpost, which is going to mean white needs to defend b2 forever and the white pieces can't attack c6. Also, it means black has a space advantage on the queen side, so the pawn majority is kind of expanded um, and become pretty strong. So that was like the concept. And, uh, you know, my original plan had been to play a4, knight here, knight here, but a weird thing happened where, for some reason, I just assumed I'd already played a4 and set up the structure with a4 and b2. Like, in my head, it was like, I wasn't thinking about it anymore. It was like I'd achieved it tactically, and now I was looking ahead, and I was trying to think of like a plan with which I could try to eventually create a second weakness. Because I knew white could defend b2, and I wasn't going to, you know, break the blockade on c5, so I wasn't going to make a pass pawn here. So I needed a second weakness, and it had to be on the king side, and I started looking, you know, 10, 20 moves ahead, schematically speaking, as to how things could develop on the king side and what play over there might look like. And I forgot to play a4 on this move, and I forgot to play a4 on the next move. Um, and uh, and so here he played a clever move, rook c2, providing extra defense to b2, like this. He notices that maybe... He's tuned in. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna blunder and and blunder I do. I continue to not play a4 and now finally he can suddenly play a4 himself. And with horror, you know, I realize that I haven't played a4. Like what? This means white can play b3 at any point, which means I don't have my outpost and my c6 pawn is gonna come under fire. What's even worse, I realize, is that if I've blundered a4, the very worst thing I could have done would have been f5 to give white knight e5 to coordinate on c6. Right now, I was thinking, you know, that White was never going to attack c6 again. That I had the knight on c4 locked in, and I was preparing to put the other knight on e4, you know, and take back with the f pawn and give White a square. But I'm thinking, like, you have to give something to get something. I'm thinking far ahead how I'm going to win. But now it's all falling apart. And this move, very clever, defending the pawn so that on pawn takes, he can come over here with the other rook, leave this rook defending b2 and pressuring c6 while he recovers the pawn. Uh, the a pawn and you know suddenly white takes over the advantage so what's really great here is that even though the game was going against him he still had that presence of mind of like or that that belief or that thought that he was still looking for opportunities to get the advantage to try and win, right? Just completely agnostic about the whole narrative of who has the advantage or who's outplaying who or who's this. He's just looking for the best moves and the best chances all the time. And he sensed this and found this moment. So the Rook C2 move was a very, very high level sneaky move. Um, and then he managed to get this. And then I was just on death's door thanks, thanks to this um, by him. Now, that said, I eventually do sort of escape and I get all the way to this rook and pawn ending, uh, down a pawn, but drawing. 
And in this position, he showed me a drawing idea that did not occur to me during the game. And I thought about this position for a long time. I had a lot of time on the clock. We were at move 43, so we had just made time control. Um, And I invested heavily in this and did not notice uh, this really sick drawing idea that he had, which was to play h5. And he taught me this in the postmortem. So this is another example of just like, learning a super cool idea from an opponent, right? Just, it's not a move that happens in the game, but it's just, you know, a lot of the highlights in Master and Grandmaster games and in between occur off the board, right? Like somebody sees something brilliant, the other person sees it too, and then they don't play down that line or somebody sees some great idea that that doesn't come up. So I'm just sharing with you a really brilliant variation. This move here, and what's the idea, right? Well, first of all, Hopefully you know some of the tactics around this like rook standoff around the pawn that's one step away from queening. In these positions, you know, white can never play king e2 because of rook g1, rook takes b2, rook takes g2 check and you take the rook. White can never play king f3 because you go rook f1 check um, and then queen. So the king's kind of stuck here. Uh, it can't run towards the pawn, it can't come up to help these pawns. It just has to stay here and avoid the tactics. But this is a super cool idea. He had h5, and if white um, pushes past, let's say, it's gonna push h4 again. Like, what is this stupid pawn doing? But the point is this pawn just comes to h3. And white cannot take the pawn on h3 without simply losing to rook h1. Is that not crazy? What an idea, huh? H5, H4, H3. I feel like maybe I'd seen that at some point in my life, but it completely had slipped my mind here, and it's a brilliant idea. And after this, black solves um, their problems very easily, like king here, takes, takes, rook here, for example. Rook b2, rook takes. And he threatened this pawn and he threatened rook g4 to g5. So you simplify down to rook and one pawn against rook and one pawn, really trivially drawn. So I didn't see that fantastic, fantastic find from my opponent. I wanna show you one other thing about my opponent, which is we get to this position here where I play rook to d1. And in this position, uh, you know, he's calculated his pawns can't queen faster than this one. So he's going to be forced to, you know, take b2 and I take here or something like that. And the pawn is far enough up that his king can't defend it anymore. So it's probably going to die. At this point here, I think a lot of players would try and take a draw back and forth, right? I mean, it doesn't look like there's any winning chance yet. You're playing against a higher rated player if, if you're in that old mentality, right? So, you know, you accept, you take the draw, you say, oh, it's not, it's not a bad result, happy with it. But my opponent plays this out anyway. And um, he took here, took here, and played here. And here, here. And here I realize that he even has this idea to try to win of going here, here, takes, 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 right? and capturing this pawn and queening this pawn. And so I realized, wow, he's actually even like playing for something as he seems to be losing this pawn. But regardless of like the win, draw, whatever situation going on in this end game, I just wanna highlight the attitude, right? That he was willing to calculate and work down to the very last pawn, right? Um. That, that effort and that mindset to push and push and push, it didn't win him this game, but it obviously sets him up in general in all future games, right? To play for the win, to push, to not fear higher rated opponents, to not be satisfied with the draw, but to be satisfied with playing all the moves you can play um, and trying everything. 
Uh, and yeah, this game did end in a draw. Black has numerous ways to, de- to defend against this. But he made me think a couple more minutes. He got to think a couple more minutes. He got to spend some more time at the board. And he gets to grow in his confidence, you know, where he doesn't have to look at title players and feel like they are superior to him or have an advantage against him or that he's less likely to win the game or anything like that. Um, so those, that's a whole bunch of highlights from just one guy. But um, uh, yeah, this uh, Dalvi Akash Sharachandra was a very strong player. Um, I looked at their games beforehand, and I went into the and I went into the match, you know, thinking that uh, he plays about as well as I do. And I finished the match and post mortems with him, and you know, still thought that. So, uh, very, very good player who showed up very well in that game and gave me a really exciting and difficult game. All right, so now let's go to the next round. Um, so now we're in round seven. And uh, I want to show you two highlights of what my opponent did here. In this game, he was immediately faced with an opening he didn't know and got pushed into a weird and tricky position where a lot of things can go wrong. But what I want to highlight, first of all, is that my opponent recognized what could go wrong and adopted an extremely difficult to adopt Uh, attitude and approach to the position. So here's what can go wrong for black. If black ever castles before white does, white can play f3, g4, and the attack is immediately a rager. Um, If you let white trade on h5, because the knight's on h6 instead of f6, that pawn on h5 is super weak, um, as well as white's got great play along the g file. Right, and the knight on h6 tends to be trapped, so you always have to watch out for queen d2 and then some kind of knight e6 or knight somewhere kind of tactic. And those tactics are going to be even more brutal if there's a rook on the g file. Right, so f3, g4, if you let white take, it's brutal. If you take on g4 and let white play h5, opening up the rook against this hanging knight on h6, uh, and the idea of h takes g6, you know, with pressure on f7, I mean, it is, it's dead. It's just immediately dead as far as I could tell. So for example, if black played castles, you know, just f3, and I would guess that, you know, pretty much on, on anything black tries to do, we'll play g4 for white. And I would just say this position is probably crushing, probably crushing. So that's the first thing. My opponent recognized uh, that danger. Meanwhile, you know, this threat on f7, you know, would make you kind of inclined to get castled, right? It's sort of annoying. Um, otherwise, you have to think, you know, do I ever want to play e6, uh, you know, and change and weaken some squares like that? Uh, you could set up the knight on e5, but after the bishop goes to b3, the knight's not that great or secure there. Um, so, what my opponent realized was that he could just sit. And then I find often that's one of the hardest things to do, especially, you know, in an unusual and complicated situation, to realize that he could just kind of sit with his king in the center as long as my king was in the center. And then whichever way I castle, he could follow me. Um, and once I've castled, he can castle safely, whether it be kingside or queenside. But if he castles first, you know, then I can launch some stuff at his king. So, I mean, the, the actual moves themselves are going to be very, very unimpressive to you in ho-hum. Like queen a5, bishop d2, and just queen back to d8. And I slightly advance my position. And that's the other thing. Like, I even have some small ways to improve my position, which could be unsettling. Um, but he realizes that there's like a maximum point to which they're going to be advanced. So your a4. And, you know, he realizes that trading on b5, a takes b5 is... Is terrible. The knight ends up not able to get back onto a good route through c6, um, and my rook gets pressure against a7 along this file. So now he just just comes right back, you know, offered the bishop trade. Yeah, didn't get it. Just comes back. That's two back and forth. I know this isn't what you expect from highlights, but this is amazing, actually. I came here. Rook b8. Another excellent move, kind of just just waiting around. And, you know, I mean, honestly, you could also just be playing queen c7, queen d8, queen c8, queen d8 kind of stuff. Uh, But there's no harm in in playing like rook b8 and a6 kind of moves as well. 
Um, but he just he just sat there, which was fantastic. And only a couple moves later, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, but I'll show you only the moment that I castled, then he castled. So he fully figured that out and just you know endured the stare down, which I think was super super impressive. Um, so very very nice find from Black. Even those moves look really stupid. They are truly not. And the second thing I want to bring us to is this position here. Uh, so in this position, I felt like things were going really, really well for white um, and that I was close to, uh, close to a decisive advantage. I had managed to play the G4 break, as you can see, even with the kings both castled, open up the G file. Um, my pieces look like they're on really good squares, right? Um, and uh, I don't know. There's all kinds of all kinds of cool stuff I could consider doing in this position here, but I couldn't find a clear knockout. And finally, I played a move which I thought might be slightly surprising to my opponent and very sneaky. Queen H3. The idea is to bring the queen to F5, and then the threat will be to eliminate this knight and go and checkmate. Very very hard to def to deal with. Black can't play e6 because we'll take this knight. If black brings the queen to stop queen f5, white will just trade queens and play rook takes a6. Or maybe knight takes e7 first and then rook takes a6. The end game is going to be lost for black, I think. Dead lost. if Close to lost or dead lost. I think dead lost. So I thought this was like a really, really challenging move. I had about 15 minutes, of which I spent 10 on this. My opponent, I think, only had two minutes left on the clock. So what's incredible is he survived so long, now it looks like he's going down, and yet in this moment, he still found uh, the best defense, which somehow I had sort of overlooked or something. But he trades the knight from f6 immediately before my queen can get to f5. If she comes to f5, the knight can come back to f6. Right, And after I take, then plays f6, challenging this knight immediately. So if queen f5, the plan is just to eliminate that piece. Um, and not only that, you know, depending where this knight goes, he might take this bishop for free and, and go on and win the game. Why not? I mean, just because you're getting wrecked positionally and a dangerous attack is coming in doesn't mean that if your opponent misses, you're not allowed to, you know, win material uh, and then convert the game as they, as they flail about failingly. So, uh, you know, that I played a move which I think is unexpected, and he was so low on time and found the best defense like this, um, I think that was super, super uh, impressive. Um, yeah, and then there was a time scramble where it was like completely a toss-up, you know? He had chances to win and I had chances to win back and forth during the time scramble, and... That's really all because he found this one this one defense here while low on time. You know, if he did anything else and let this queen get to f5, I think um, there would have been no no resisting anymore. So to find that under time pressure was really was really nice. It's not super easy or obvious. Um, since technically this is about highlights, let me show you a brilliant idea that doesn't work that I considered here. Knight into the outpost, right? That's the dream, but then we have to sack this. Now we now we sack this too. Threatening checkmate, takes, check, here. C4. This is the first idea that occurred to me when my opponent played F6. And I thought, there's no way. There's no way I could sack the piece and then the rook, no recapture, and this would work. And then I calculated for a bit, and I thought, oh my God, it works. Black's, Black's checkmated. They can throw a lot of pieces away on the G file, you know, bishop e3 to g5, or knight g4, or rook f7 to g7, but it's checkmate. <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, I haven't, I haven't checked it. I could check it. You could check it. Better to have some uncertainty and think for ourselves. But I think this was just straight up checkmate, this crazy sack. But unfortunately, I couldn't go for it because 
yeah, I think it's in this position. Instead of taking the rook, there's rook f7. And then the rook comes to h7 and, and covers the king. Stops any checkmates on the h-file and on g7 at the same time. And yeah, I think I noticed that just in time when I was getting all excited about the, you know, bishop and, and rook sacrifice variation. Some lucky chance caused me to double check any alternatives earlier in the line. Instead of just staring in disbelief at that position down all the pieces and saying, is it really checkmate? Oh my god, it's really checkmate. Um, and I caught that and did not lose the game that way, at least. Okay, so, um, fantastic uh, play by uh, Tony Gallego Bergada. Now we advance to round eight. Um, and here, uh, my opponent, Grandmaster Abital Borchowski, is caught in my opening prep. And I think I've played the move somewhat quickly, and he might have an inkling that he's in my opening preparations here. Um, and uh, the standard move in this kind of position, I think, is bishop a6. The secondary move, bishop b7. Uh, but my opponent put in some real work and absolutely dismantled this position. So, you know, I won't be repeating this opening. I expect nobody who sees this video will ever be repeating this opening for white. Um, but he plays this fantastic move, knight c6, immediately putting pressure on the dark square, which I think is most logical after f3 and with this light squared bishop wanting to come out um, and with the possibility of maybe hitting this pawn with either queen f6 or queen h4 check in some cases, probably threatening to win the pawn, and asking me immediately to make a decision between d5 and dc5. Now, I think what's maybe not so nice looking about this is that in a lot of cases, the next move for white is d5. Like, if you play bishop b7, you know, you, you might be expecting d5. And already, like, two moves before, I think the main move of opening theory here is probably d5 already, but I threw in this trade first. Um, so if your opponent's going to play d5, it's not super obvious to put your knight on c6. I mean, sometimes that's the whole difference between whether or not somebody wants to play d4 or d5 or not, is whether or not they're going to get that tempo on the way. And here he voluntarily steps in front of that, and to do so, he had to see very, very clearly into the position after d5. Um, so after d5, and I think I even expected his knight was coming to e5 during the game, centralizing, but he then played knight a5. I realized, oh my god. I mean, this knight, if I can defend c4, it looks pretty stupid, right? But that's a bit of an if. It's not so easy to defend c4. If I play b4 here to just kick the knight to absolute hell, if that knight's on b7, it's... He's got this tactic here. Bishop takes c4, queen h4 check. Famous tactic. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I just played e4 to cut off the queen along the fourth rank. So I'm defending knight takes c4 by blocking queen h4 check. Um, you know, any bishop move to e2 or d3 would have allowed knight c4 as well. Um, I guess maybe I could try b3. I wonder I wonder how good or bad b3 would have been. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, it gives up on the idea of playing b4. But if I could contain the knight, put my queen on c2 and cover everything, that might already help. I think I was probably also worried about my opponent going for something like takes takes here before I castled and then the queen has to cover b3 so she can't come defend these points so I'm playing a move like this and then maybe even f5 and I was, I was pretty worried to play like this before I even get castled. Another thing is that if black just puts the queen on g5 in these positions because my queen's defending b3 I can't defend the dark scores with my queen. Uh, maybe, you know, I could hang on with king f2. But, um, yeah, I must have must have had some concerns of having my queen tied down to b3. Like, that was, yeah, that's going to be a problem because if I'm not chasing this knight, if I'm just defending against the knight with my queen forever, that's not a good use of my queen. Yeah, I can see why b3 
It was not my choice. Okay, so I go e4. Black plays a very calm move, d6. Um, which blocks me from playing d6. Um, and prepares for the bishop to be able to come out this way if it wants to, as well as this way. Uh, and I think, okay, I've got a breathing moment. I can, I can develop and get castled. And now another piercing move, queen f6. The idea of this move is to play bishop a6 next and then win the pawn on c4. Uh, when I won't be able to play b3 because the knight will be, uh, because the knight will be under attack. Um, and not only that, I had this dream in general to meet the move bishop a6 with this tactic. b4 hitting the knight, knight takes b5. I didn't just want to defend, you know. I didn't want to just survive. I wanted to live. Like they say in all the stupid sci-fis, right? So b4, and if takes takes here, then I have this. Um... So that was kind of what I was what I was thinking of doing against bishop a6. So the move queen f6 is really, by attacking the knight, it's really threatening bishop a6, and I have to play a defensive move around that. So I do. I play rook c1, and now he reveals more of the plan with e takes d5 at a really inconvenient moment for me, actually, because in some other cases, if you play e takes d5, white might take with the knight, or the queen or something like that. But here, if I take with the knight, I'm giving up the b2 pawn, and then these are all isolated and, and crummy. And I even thought of a pseudo-clever move here, but then realized that it's not good either in this position, which is b4, he goes knight c6, while there's, he can transfer through c6 while there's no pawn on d5. And then whatever I do, this knight lands on d4 next, right? And I'm worse, definitely worse, right? I can't attack d6, my pieces are all kind of blocked up, the bishop's really blocked up, the rook's blocked up. Um, and I've weakened my queen side quite a bit with these thrusts, um, given that black has the majority and with a knight outpost on d4, black's gonna take over playing on the queen side in a second. So very nice time he found to do this, and after c takes d5, he develops the bishop, I finally get castled, and he completes the plan with c4, and we can see, you know, he's gonna get b5, rook c8, just an amazing dream Benoni for black. The knight can actually, it's not threat, it's not forced back to b7 eventually. I was still thinking, even with the bad bishop and the bad Benoni, if I play b4 at the right time and the knight ends up on b7, that could be enough to compensate me for all the things that are wrong with my position, like the dark squares, the simplification towards an end game, which favors the Benoni. But after this move, I've got none of that left because this knight can always come through b3 and get into the game, right? Through d4 or c5. I mean, this knight's got all kinds of hops. No longer bad. Um, there's no bishop, and the bishop on g7 is a classic for the Benoni, but this is even better than a bishop on g7. He's got the long diagonal with the queen, and I can't even challenge her or try and trade it. So this position is very, very, very nice for uh, black at this point here. And that's just a very instructive, complicated, multi-part demolition of my position, honestly. And I think it's really, really instructive how brutally he takes apart white's position and just how precisely, right, clinically, surgically, five, six moves, um, and he just ruins my position. If you look at this position, black's castled first, but I've got one piece out and black doesn't. I've got a reasonable center, what's what's wrong? But he just, you know, and I've got space, but he just plays around it. D6, patient, now the queen to F6, threatening bishop A6, which he then doesn't need with a clever E takes D5 at a bad moment for me. Switches to here to just coordinate the rooks and uh, get the queen side majority going. And just like that, opening refuted. So... And I anticipated a whole bunch of different things. And I want to say several of those moves I didn't anticipate. This was not the most obvious approach for black to this position. There were many, many other approaches that looked plausible. But this one was really, really strong. 
All right, and now we're gonna skip round nine like we skipped round five. Round nine is gonna get is gonna be shown in part four of this series, and we're gonna now uh, look at round ten as our last uh, segment from today's video. So uh, here we've got Guillaume Lamar uh, playing black, and uh, as you can see, the pawn structure is symmetrical. Um, and Guillaume has been trying to make something out of nothing, and uh, which is tough to do, especially when you have an opponent who is willing to, you know, keep things equal and make a draw, and they're not trying to do anything, and you have to, you know, squeeze water out of the stone, so to speak, yourself. You have to create everything on your own. It'd be very, very hard to do, and often seem like thankless and hopeless, right? A lot of people complain about exchange Frenches, exchange Slavs. Uh, this is a bit different because it's sort of the super open kind of position, but you could still see, you know, you have to bring your rooks to the center, rooks trade off, what are you going to do? Um, and it's round 10, and it's a morning round. We switch from night rounds, nine rounds in a row to a morning round, round 10. You know, where's that desire to, to try and squeeze a little bit more out of a stone in the last round, right? A lot of people are agreeing to draws on... Well, this tournament had no draws before move 30 rule, but maybe re making repetitions. But traditionally, in a lot of tournaments in the last round, when people aren't playing for a big prize, you just see games that are not that motivated, right? They may make simple moves back and forth. They don't have to agree to a draw. They can just play moves like, you know, rook d8, rook takes, rook d8, rook d1, rook takes, queen takes, bishop takes, queen takes, you know, till there's nothing on the board. I'm sure you've seen that kind of game uh, before if you've looked at any professional tournaments. But he found the will to do it. And he said even here, he was like very close to just feeling like he couldn't find anything and he was just gonna go back and forth and, and take the draw here at this point. Uh, you know, he's played 36 moves. He's made an effort. He's worked hard at the board. He's used his time. Uh, but finally he convinced himself that there was an implausible move that he'd been avoiding all along, uh, but he could actually make it work here. So he starts with the trade and then he plays f5. So that's the first like highlight here is just that Guillaume was willing to, you know, work that hard on a game which to some people wouldn't matter. But it mattered a lot to me and it mattered a lot to Guillaume, you know. For us, it's like it's our chance to play chess and we're gonna play it. <laughs> you know, we're gonna play chess. Um so he finds this move, and in general, you don't want to weaken the light squares on the king side or move the f pawn forward like this. It's more likely to hurt you when white uh, comes into the seventh rank or this diagonal than to help you. But he's found this one moment where he can actually do it. And if the knight goes to g3, he has bishop d6. And I think long ago, I would sort of dismissed this idea as not working for black tactically because of, you know, rook takes... Queen takes, knight takes h5, which is illegal. So it holds together. And similarly against queen f5, black can just take because the knight is, is pinned. Or if you want to be really precise, you can also take it with check and then take the queen. So it turns out he can play bishop d6 here. I don't have f4. The knight's tangled up, attacked a million ways. And uh, it looks perhaps dead or perhaps scary, depending on whether you notice the idea of queen c4 check, queen h4 defending this. If you don't see that, you might think, yeah, it's just dead, white loses a piece. Okay, easy. Uh, or maybe an exchange, right? This could be a desperation exchange sack like this. Um, it's like a, say, 95% chance that a computer tells you it's lost, maybe 99%, but in practical play, probably still a 20 to 25% chance of saving it because it's very, very difficult to win for black. You know, lots of things, lots of work to do. Um, but okay, first of all, avoiding the draw, playing to the last thing on the last game, no matter what the circumstance. Yeah, beautiful, good work. Um, and by the way, like, partly because we're low on time and it was stressful, this, this bears fruits. Like, we were both down to just a couple minutes and, you know, he had the the sang froid to, to keep going even though it looked wrong. And I should have actually played knight g3, I think, um, and then played this queen transfer I mentioned. It looks ugly like your queen's trapped, your knight's trapped, your bishop's trapped, nothing can move or defend each other. Um, 
think, you know, rook e2 might look like a crushing move, but then there's rook d6, queen d6, queen h5, I think, saving it. So I don't think that black necessarily wins here. Like, white maybe still holds on, but it's so ugly and hard to choose to make this move. King can't, king can't move without hanging the knight. Queen can't move, can't take, because you'd be hanging the queen. It's brutal. But I was so low on time that I played knight c3. Instead, it was move 39, and I just didn't have the time to satisfy myself that queen h4 wasn't going to be losing. So he gives the check here, brings the knight, and uh, I've prepared this. And, you know, I'd seen, uh, you know, a pretty strong move for black in this position, and I thought there was a, you know, I didn't think this position was good for white. <laughs> but I was just too scared of that other position. And that kind of says when you see kind of a refutation, you see a line that doesn't have a refutation but looks terrible, it's, it's hard to pick between that. Maybe you should go for the move that looks improbable but doesn't have a clear refutation within the one or two minutes you have. I don't know. It's hard to say because the lesson can be right or wrong in different cases. Um, now, if you think you are an absolute super genius, you can pause the video and try to find what Guillaume did. And if you just want to appreciate a super genius at work a little bit more, you can pause your video and think about what Guillaume did. And th then when you don't find it, it'll give you more appreciation of the fact that he found it. Okay? So I'm gonna assume you're back and I'm gonna talk more. If you wanted to pause it, hurry up and pause. So what I had expected when I played for this, among other things, I had expected a few things, but the main thing I expected was this move, rookie two a kind of explosive interference tactic around this checkmate. The knight can't take because of mate in one. So I would have to give up the queen, takes, takes, and play this position with rook and knight against queen. And that was kind of my, you know, I was willing to basically probably lose this position, but put up resistance versus having the queen on h4 and being afraid that I was blundering something I didn't yet see. So in this case, I guess I should have played queen h4, but it's hard to know as a general rule. Okay, that's possible. You know, black's got fair winning chances. White still has drawing chances as well, I think. Um, but he went for something more savage. He took here first, check. King here. Now in this position, I'd looked at queen h5. I'd looked at queen g3. I'd looked at knight back to f4. But I had not looked at the follow-up that was the point of knight h3 from Guillaume. Of course, you know, I saw knight h3, but I didn't see knight f2 check, double x clear, oh my god! Now there's a highlight for you all, finally, a true highlight. Um, into open air, three different white pieces on that square, but he stuffs the king's escape route against the checkmate, and it's all with checks. So there's no time to stop the queen from coming, coming, coming down here. So for example, here, 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 the king could go here, right? Nope. Oh, should we see it again? Let's go with our queen. Check, here, checkmate, oof. Yeah, bishop, same thing. Here, 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 and now check, here, and mate. Oh. I haven't played in a while, but I can't remember the last time somebody did me this dirty. I mean, just <laughs> right in the middle of all my everything. Just ah. now, that's you know, that's a diagram. That's a that's a that's a textbook position. That's a go straight into a tactics book, tactics trainer, whatever. Holy moly! Got electrified by that move. Now. I don't know Guillaume that well, but one thing Guillaume can do is calculate. Holy moly. Not only did Guillaume find this, but let me fast forward for you guys a little bit. I, I gamely continued on like I used to in lost positions. Played a few more moves. Um, I'm down in exchange. Plus, my king position is still just always threatened to, to get checkmated by queen h5. And my knight doesn't have an outpost square to try and fight against a rook, right? So, okay, it's basically just lost. The knight's going to lose to the rook in the middle game because my king's checkmated. And in the end game, because the knight's way worse than a rook in an end game. You know, I don't have a pawn for it. I don't have an outpost, nothing. There's pawns on both sides of the board. It's done. I can just resign. 
And in my head, I had kind of uh, thought of resigning and just, you know, kind of went down a variation that I'd seen and, and resigned. But Guillaume points out that if I hadn't been resigned to resigning, there was still a shocking tactical resource for white available here. Do you guys see anything for white to try? You can pause the video if you want to compare yourselves to this tactical super genius again. <laughs> All right, move I had not even dreamed of. Check out this move. Knight f6, what the heck? Doesn't seem to make any sense, right? What's the connection? I've got no active pieces. I'm not threatening or attacking anything. What? Rook g4? Draw, down two rooks. Or, you know, queen takes, pawn takes. And this king's, I mean, white's gonna draw this end game, I think, queen against two rooks. That black king is too exposed. There's nowhere to hide it from the perpetuals. Um, you know, you can't take on g4 because of queen g6. If you let white take on f5, white's got queen and pawn against two rooks. I mean, you might even be worse. You could even lose this as black. So, oh my god. I didn't even see knight f6. And the truth is, if knight f6 worked and I was playing here as white, I wouldn't have noticed it. I would have just gone ahead and lost the game. If I were playing black and knight f6 worked, I would have blundered it and thrown away my win like this, but Guillaume saw it on, would see it on either side. If he were white, he would find that last chance, and if he were black, he would check for it and find it. And it turns out that black can still win the game only one way, king h8, knight takes, and then it's check here, check, and you recover the rook, not the knight, and you still win. Can you believe that? What an otherworldly calculating machine, right? I mean, to see all these variations for himself, for his opponent, I was impressed. I was impressed. What a, what a sick move, you know? If somehow there weren't this king h8 move that this whole thing would work is just, it's just crazy. Yeah, it's just crazy. Because like, King f8, there's queen c5, right? King f7, um, you can now take, and now the king is exposed to this. So after we do this maneuver and grab the rook, you have to go here probably, there's this move, saving white as well. So literally only king h8 to get out of this knight f6. Wow. <laughs> that guy beat the heck out of me. Holy moly. And, you know, it could be like a little embarrassing or whatever to have a symmetrical position, to have equality with white, to move back and forth like you're willing to take a repetition because you don't see any way to stop because your opponent's, you know, better than you and they're slowly taking over the game. And then to get socked like this, you know, to eat a knight f2 in the face and all that, but whatever, this guy was just good. I mean, it was super cool to see this tactic, to have it happen on the board, to be able to show you guys this is cool. Um, and, uh, you know, to postmortem with him and, and stuff, to, to see that knight f6 idea and enlarge in my, because this, okay, it's awesome, but I have seen ideas like this at some point in my life, you know? But this knight f6 enlarged my entire notion of chess. I, I had not seen some kind of scrappy insanity like this in a while. I had not been thinking along these lines at all. And this is this is just from out of really, really improbable. It doesn't have the normal elements of a tactic, right? That this queen's gonna come into g6. Um I even had a winning knight f6 check in one of my games this tournament. There are versions of this that I could see coming, but this, like, queen through the f-pawn with rook g4, I've never seen anything like this. Um, and in general, I think it's very, very rare in chess for somebody to see a tactic that's based on a pattern they haven't seen before. 
I feel like almost any time you find a tactic, it's a mix of some patterns that you've seen before. So for my opponent to play a tactic or to see this tactic for me, for the opponent, based on a pattern which I don't know that anyone's ever seen that before, uh, incredible creativity and, and shocking find for him. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. It only gets better in videos three and four. I've saved the two best games for last. That was the third best game that you just saw there where I got <laughs> taken out. Um, we've got two games to show you and one last little segment um, that I've saved from another game. So uh, there's more brilliancies or highlights to come. See you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Keep being awesome.